Okay, great. Welcome everyone. Uh, so Laura, you can go ahead and, and pin me. I'll introduce myself and you can stop the screen share. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Sarah Spring. I'm the executive director of the Documentary Organization of Canada. And uh, I just wanted to say a couple of words of welcome before we begin this conversation. Um, so DOC uh, would like to honor the land that we are on, which has been the site of human activity for thousands of years. DOC is a national organization, but our head office is located on the traditional territories of the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Mississauga of the Credit River First Nations. Ontario is covered by 46 treaties and other agreements, and is home to many Indigenous nations from across Turtle Island, including the Inuit and the Métis. These treaties and other agreements, including the One Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, are agreements to peaceably share and care for the land and its resources. Other Indigenous nations, Europeans, and newcomers were invited into this covenant in the spirit of respect, peace, and friendship. We are mindful of broken covenants, and we strive to make this right with the land and with each other. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, newcomers in this generation or generations past. Some of us came here forcibly, particularly as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. We invite you to explore Native Land Digital that strives to create and foster conversations about the history of colonialism, Indigenous ways of doing, and settler Indigenous relations through educational resources such as this map. Native Land Digital creates spaces where non-Indigenous people can be invited and challenged to learn more about the lands that they inhabit, the history of those lands, and how to actively part of a better future growing together. Uh, and um, we say these uh, words of welcome just to kind of contextualize where we are, the conversation. Um, Doc is committed to thinking through how to incorporate these discussions into all of our programming and our work. Um, so thank you for listening to the land acknowledgement today. Um, so we are really, really happy to have such an interesting group of people to join us today. Um, this conversation is going to focus on the genre of feature documentaries with an eye to upcoming deadlines at Story Money Impact, the Telefilm Feature Documentary Program, the renewed CMF envelopes, and the soon to be announced CMF guidelines for their POV program. So all of the panelists today are interested in engaging with the author-driven documentary in different ways. And what's really exciting is that these are also partners for your film that can not only work with you, but work together. So I'm really pleased to be joined by Christina Willings, the Senior Production Executive and Senior Program Manager at TELUS, Michelle Van Musicom, the President and CEO of Knowledge Network, Patrice Ramsey, the Executive Producer, Independent Production at Knowledge, Adam Garnett-Jones, the Director of TV Content and Special Events at APTM, and Sue Bealey, the Executive Director of Story Money Impact. Welcome everyone. Thank you. And we can pin all of the purchases, all of the panelists now as well. So happy to have you all. Thank you very much. So the structure of the conversation will uh, will be having a 40 minute discussion and then 20 minutes of Q&A. So you can post your questions in the chat and at the end, uh, we'll have a chance to pose all the questions to the panelists. And um, please keep your audio on mute, but if you wanna have your videos on, you're more than welcome to. It's nice to see everybody here. Um, the session is being recorded. So if anyone reaches out to you and uh, tells you they weren't able to make it, then you can tell them to email the doc staff and we'll send them the link. Um, before we get started, we just wanna get a little bit of a sense of who's in the room, because it can help to frame the discussion. So Tazine, you can launch our poll and please just take a minute and um, answer it. It's just about the years of experience you have working within the documentary sector. Okay, can everybody see the poll? Not yet. Yeah. 
Okay. Just give it a second. Okay. Well, maybe while we're waiting for that, I mean, we couldn't just we could just get started because um, I really want to start with just like a quick tour around the table of everyone um, and just maybe speak about because maybe not everyone's familiar with your organization or there's been some shifts. Um, so maybe you can just talk about some of the ways that you work with or program creative documentaries and I'll start. We'll go in a circle. Christine, I'll start with you we're on my right. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Telus supports uh, uh, creative content creation in Western Canada, specifically, and has done since 2013 through various programs. You probably all are aware that we have the Story Hive program, also now Story Hive Voices and Community Voices programs. Recently, we've launched a live streaming program. So we've really been uh, here to support specifically historically emerging voices. And more recently, I've really expanded our support for um, more established and senior voices as well through the TELUS Originals program. The TELUS Originals program is the one primarily I'm here representing today. And um, we also are uh, in the initial stages of launching a new program that I'll be happy to tell you about a little later on in more detail. Um, and through that program, we'll be supporting both Western Canadian documentary production as well as some, um, some productions that are outside of Western Canada. So some really exciting developments uh, on our side and really look forward to this panel. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, and this is the first time you're gonna be able to work with filmmakers who aren't in the Western region of the country, is that right? That is correct, yes. Okay, very exciting. Thank you, Christina. Looking forward to hearing about that. Uh, over to you, Patrice. Same question. Um, great, thank you for having us. Um, so my name is Patrice Ramsey, independent producer um, at Knowledge Network. And um, yeah, so we commission um, specifically with producers based in British Columbia. Um, and we do second window um, with producers outside of BC across Canada. Um, in terms of our commissioning slate, we primarily commission for our Storyville strand, which is our flagship documentary strand, um, you know, to sort of give you a sense of the capacity. Every year is a little bit different, but generally we might be able to support um, a limited ser documentary series every year, as, as well as maybe um, three or four one-off documentaries. Um, we look at projects on an ongoing basis, so you can come and have a chat with us at any point, um, but we are definitely tied into the funding cycle. So that's just a real kind of general overview of knowledge. Right. So you tend funding cycle. So you tend to green light once your CMF envelope is renewed and then you're kind of commissioning up You sort of leading thinking about your commissions and then you green light them once the spring envelope yeah has, yeah you know. so so a lot of projects we put into development last fiscal year that are all, all coming to fruition and coming in um, and hopefully lining up at the early stages when the cmf envelope has just announced and those projects hopefully will move into production this fiscal year so that's kind of the timelines for us great thank you so much uh, michelle do you want to say a few words and welcome to Knowledge. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sarah. It's great to see so many familiar faces on the call. So I'm um, brand new at Knowledge, started on February 4th, have just finished wrapping up my move in um, Montreal. For those of you who don't know me, I um, was previously in Sarah's shoes for about a year and was also at the National Film Board for, for quite a while as the head of English language production. Um, I'll just share super briefly, um, it might be useful for you to see knowledge through my newbie eyes. Um, things that stood out for me is the size. Knowledge projects a lot bigger than it is. It's a small provincial broadcaster, so kind of like CBC, but just for the province of BC. We're 50 employees. Uh, we're largely an acquisitions-based channel. From 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., we're broadcasting kid shows to make sure that kids and parents have access to quality educational programming. 
And then from 6 p.m. to uh, 6 a.m., it's adult programming. And pride of place in that schedule are our knowledge originals, which are documentaries. Uh, the vast, vast majority of our commissions, other than some kids, second windows, our documentaries, as Patrice outlined, we don't do very many, but we really get behind them to support them and make sure that our viewers know about them. Um, in terms of what's kind of coming up for us, really keen to be um, engaging with a broader cross section of creators, to be engaging with uh, broadcast partners, developing new um, windowing strategies to make sure we're really maximizing opportunities. And with, you know, C11 um, coming down the pipe, making sure that we're working with partners strategically to maximize access to that new money that is coming into the system to make sure that BC creators in particular are getting their fair share. It's no secret that BC filmmakers tend to be underrepresented when we look at accessing national envelopes. So that's something knowledge really wants to do its part in changing. Okay, thank you so much, Michelle. And again, so um, so knowledge tends to work mostly with with filmmakers out west, but some of the acquisitions could be or second windows could be for filmmakers across the country. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, Adam, great to have you. Um, really love to hear a bit about APTN, um, so the creative documentary, um, whether it's one off feature series. How do you engage with filmmakers in these genres? Sure. So uh, for those of you who don't know, APTN is uh, the world's first national Indigenous broadcaster. Uh, we have four channels that screen across the, the country. Um, we do a ton of documentary series. I think it's really the bread and butter of what APTN does. We do a lot of work uh, in Indigenous languages as well, and we're trying to do uh, more and more uh, Indigenous language work all the time. Uh, we primarily work with Indigenous filmmakers so um, and Indigenous companies. So if you're going to work with APTN as a first window broadcaster, then the project needs to be uh, majority Indigenous owned and controlled. Uh, but we also work uh, with non-Indigenous creators on uh, second window uh, projects from time to time. Um, so as I said, the, the bread and butter of, of what we do is a lot of documentary series, although we do do scripted as well. Um, primarily in collaboration with uh, other broadcast partners across the country. Um, and um, we're happy that this year, actually this winter, we just launched a feature documentary strand uh, for the first time on the channel. Uh, we used to uh, commission, but, but mostly acquire a lot of one hour docs, um, but we're really doing a lot more commissioning of feature documentaries right now and really leaning into, uh, leaning into that and hoping to discover uh, and support new voices, uh, new stories and really drive people to uh, the channel who love feature length documentary storytelling. That's fantastic news, Adam. Do you know approximately how many feature docs you might want to have on your slate this year? Ooh, no. Not yet. Okay, I'll just, I'll <laughs> pose the question just, just to see, so, but anyway, we can follow up at a later. Yeah, we're trying, I mean, it's be because it's new, um, basically what we're trying to do is populate this strand. And as you know, you know, you can commission a project and sometimes a project can be done within you know, 18 months from commissioning it. Sometimes it can take years. And so we're trying to right now figure out where that sweet spot is so that we're not um, over commissioning and, and we're continuing to feed that um, that that strand uh, as time passes. So I don't, I'm not trying to be evasive, but uh, we are really trying to figure out what the what the sweet spot is and what that number is per year. Okay, I just have one last little question for you. Are you going to be wanting to develop these projects and then put them into production um, for this feature doc slot? Not currently for the feature, we're not developing feature docs. Um, we're just, we just have production. That could change as time passes. Um, there is the CMF um, IP development um, program that we do help some feature uh, doc filmmakers access. So that's a little bit of a way in, but in general, um, because it's a small, the feature docs in particular are a small part of what we do. Um, we haven't focused on developing those. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and Sue, I'm so happy to have you here, Sue, because I think that um, outside of the West Coast, not a ton of doc filmmakers know about story money impact. And it's really interesting 
um, the, the space that SMI has been taking up and the amazing work you've been doing, and also kind of in the context of the changing um, guidelines, specifically at Telefilm, where, um, you know, they are looking at your outreach campaign as a major part of analyzing the theatrical documentary program. In case anyone isn't aware, Telefilm recently did change their guidelines so that for documentaries under 500,000, you don't need a distributor to submit. Um, and so this was a huge change. Doc has been advocating for this for a long time because it was really prohibitive for a lot of filmmakers to submit with a distributor. So um, collaborations with Story Money Impact, outreach campaigns, impact campaigns are actually a great way to um, get through some of those barriers that have been around for a long time. So Sue, you can speak to this better than I can, but I'd love to hear about, um, you know, what are some of the, what are some of the things that Story Money Impact does and what are the engagement that you have with featured documentaries or creative documentaries? Because a lot of them come in at TV hours, I guess. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And um, we are a national organization, Story Money Impact, and we have supported films in Alberta, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, Ontario. So um, we are based in Vancouver as head office, but we have staff all over. Um, our main remit is to maximize our the social and environmental impact potential of the documentary films that have the potential to be used as impact tools. Not all documentary films are considered impact tools or impact product or impact films. Um, but if the film incites and inspires or explores something that's a pressing issue that we think um, the movement on the ground that is using in working in that issue where it can use the film, then that's something we're interested in. Um, we are a growing organization. We became a charity a few years ago. And so that is fantastic for how we can start to access different funding. However, it also puts some limitations on what we can do under CRA's charitable restrictions. So this means that we cannot do anything with production because we cannot use, not use charitable money to support mm -hmm. production of uh, private IP. However, we are positioned to help mentor a little bit in early stage development, and we are positioned to do what we're calling our definition, and there's lots of definitions of this, but Story Money Impact's definition of impact work, which is sort of lovingly taking that beautiful film, and the filmmakers are so tired and exhausted, and helping to work with them to create a strategy of where can this film make change? What would our impact goals be? And to get extremely focused on that and then um, support the work that it takes to do um, that execution in community, evaluate it. Um, our goal is not just to have people see the work, but is to have see the work, have a dialogue, have other resources, have onboarding sort of paths to what they can do for action, whether it's donate, promote, volunteer, support a local organization. So we actually want to see the fact that um, our goal is that whatever the issues that's being explored in the documentary, we help people become engaged into action. So we have three um, main programs or our core programs, our impact mentorship, which is for early stage documentary films and development, generally for underrepresented creators at the moment, unless we get more money and we can expand that program. So that's early stage for filmmakers development, think about impact. Our second main program is Story to Action, where we work with completed and premiered films from shorts to features, where we see there's impact potential. And the SMI team works with the film for about eight months to execute what we call the impact pilot campaign. So we figure out all the materials and the goals and we test all that and see if that works. Um, and that call for applications may be opening in May. If you think you have a film that would be appropriate for story um, to action, I would love to hear about it because we have a lot of screening to do. And we'd like to get a jump on it ahead of time. And then our third program that um, we are just interviewing for is our pod program, which is to teach and train impact practitioners in Canada how to do impact work um, so that we can have more of these folks to service all of your gorgeous work. I'm going to try and stop there. I can see a lot more, but I'll wait for questions. I think that there are going to be a lot of questions because it is pretty incredible um, what you guys are doing. And um, so how many projects do you support through the different programs? Yeah, really few. Every impact mentorship program, which is the early stage docs and development, we take three program, three projects. Uh, we're trying to expand the funding for that so we can run that multiple times a year because there's just so many incredible documentaries in development. For our story to action program, we take 
five completed films that are absolutely ready for us to work with them in community. We don't want your film if we can't take it out right away. So if you've got um, rights restrictions on it, wait <laughs> and apply when your film is available. Don't hold us back on the work. Um, and then in our pod program, we take five people a year to train them up. Um, and then we also continue to work with our alumni films that have gone through programs because we fall in love with them. And then we have all these resources and we have our pilot, we have all these partners. And then often um, because we've done the pilot and we have results from that, sometimes we can shake out more money from foundations or donors because we are a charity to continue that work, specifically who, people who are really interested in that issue area. Okay, can I just ask one more question? So when you say the, there can't be rights restrictions, if someone has a broadcast license and so those rights are tied up, is that an issue for working with Story Money Impact? As long as we have the ability to use your freedom in community, uh, we need to be able to do that, whether that's uh, in a restricted uh, virtual environment where there's a link that collapses that gets only given to certain people, or whether it's like we can take the film and start to play it for book clubs, or we can play it for uh, sustainability groups, or we could play it for, uh, like, we need to be able to do that. Um, some distributors, I know that, you know, this is one of the conversations is what do you need to negotiate with your distributor? Um, and if you, you know, we're, we often do is we're going to a community that in a way I like to say doesn't really impact the ROI of the distributor because a lot of the people we're going to are not going to film festivals and don't buy tickets to go to theaters. So in a way we pay license fees. So it's an additional um, financial stream for your distributor. But in the legalese, we need to make sure that there's either an amendment or an agreement so that we can do that, this work, and it's not upsetting them or breaking the law. Um, and then, of course, things like CBC GEM and other knowledge, we can also say, well, we'll do this work. And every time we do a screening, we'll do it from the link on their platform and they get the play. So there's, you know, this is a, this is a new discussion in Canada. And um, I know that TELUS has been a great partner. CBC has been a great partner. Um, NFB is a great partner. We can only work with NFB co-productions, not full NFB productions. But um, the more we do this work and the more we work in the institutions, we understand how to play well together. Um, it's just really great. Yeah, well, it seems like there's a huge energy around um, collaborating the different groups um, working together. And I, I, I think that is so important moving forward that everyone understands um, where to be flexible to support the work getting out there. Um, I'll say one little thing here too. Yeah, it's please. Great comments from Inder and John or whatever. I just want to say, you know, SMI is a charity and we're working on a shoestring and doing a lot with a little, anybody who wants to be a monthly donor or a donor who has other people who, you know, knows that this becoming a charity was sort of like, a gift to the community. We want this to be an enduring organization that serves everybody and grows over time. And if you have the capacity to help build it, um, we always appreciate that. We're trying to do a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sue. There. No, for sure. Um, so just in that spirit of, of collaboration, so just thinking about some of the new, like one of the reasons we're having this conversation is there's some new developments and I, you know, going to you, Christina, maybe you can talk about the big change that okay. happened at TELUS and how that makes you able to start working with all these groups in new ways. Thank you, Sarah. And if you don't mind, I'll also take a few moments just to kind of catch up because I defaulted to a very high level introduction and didn't really engage with how we um, support um, uh, the production of creative documentary in the West. So I'll, I'll just give a little bit of a catch up and then move into the, the, uh, the new developments. Uh, if I may. Please. So, yeah, thanks. Um, so, uh, the TELUS Originals program has been um, moved in 2017 from a program that primarily engaged a slate producer to produce documentary content, short form, mid, and longer form, but mainly in the short and mid range. Um, to one where we actually went out and sought out production partners in community and began to commission films from independent producers in BC and Alberta. Um, and so um, that is when the program really began to expand. And when we really made a commitment, um, and it's in the DNA of our program, both to um, uh, prioritize true representation um, and specifically representation both geographically and also of traditionally disenfranchised underrepresented groups. Um, and also not to encumber producers. 
really not to encumber filmmakers. So in terms of Sue's comments, I mean, we are very happily working. One of our films is happily working with SMI right now. We're thrilled to be beginning that kind of partnership, although it's the producer's partnership, not ours, but we're doing what we can to support it. Um, and um, we also are able to give, for example, where a film is doing really well, has a lot of festival selections or has aspirations to other kinds of distribution, we're able to contemplate web holdbacks. We now actually have language in our contract saying that we will give you at least a six month web holdback and we can do uh, further holdbacks and even sometimes BOD holdbacks um, on, um, on consultation with us where there's a, a bona fide opportunity pending for the filmmaker. Um, we, we operate, we're not a broadcaster, and so we give production contributions to documentaries, and these days from mid-length to feature-length documentaries, and as you know, there aren't many people doing that, and so we're really happy to be able to support you in Western Canada specifically. Um, our contributions vary from sort of 30 grand up to 250 grand, and as some of you may know, traditionally, um, well, not just traditionally, per our conditions of license, per TELUS's conditions of license with the CRTC, we're limited in terms of how many other of the usual financers you can bring into your financing structure. So um, what that means for us is that, um, fortunately, producers are not free to sell second windows to conventional broadcast entities like CTV, CBC, um, all the usual players. Um, and so that's also one of the reasons we give larger production contributions. You can, of course, bring tax credits, Creative BC, um, and even private, private monies of various kinds. We're okay with that, um, um, oddly, in terms of how we contrast with other people. But um, traditionally, we've not been able to encompass any kind of second window sales in your financing structure. Um, however, this year, we... Um, are now able to encompass second window sales, which is one of the reasons we're here, um, from um, uh, broadcasters who do not receive heritage fund money. So because TELUS pays into heritage fund money, if we, have, if we accept broadcast money into the financing structure of the films that we support, the CRTC sees us as clawing back our contributions to the Heritage Fund, which really puts us offside. However, Knowledge and APTN um, do not receive any Heritage Fund money. This is also true of TVO. And so we are now able to accept second window sales in your financing structure from knowledge and from APTN. And I think this is really exciting news, certainly for us, and I hope also for you. Um, it allows us to uh, support you to build out your financing structure and um, to make films that potentially have larger reach. Um, there are, um, you know, nuances, of course, as there always are. Um, one of the things I also want to correct, Sarah, I said earlier that we uh, support filmmakers only through this program in BC and Alberta. It's not entirely true. All the films that we support need to be reflective of communities, specific communities in BC and Alberta. But we do sometimes support producers whose companies are outside of BC and Alberta, right? So the producer, for example, we have a film right now, uh, the producer lives in Montreal, but the content is entirely focused on a story unfolding in BC and Alberta, right? And so we're able to support that. Of course, it's unusual that that happens because most people who don't live in BC and Alberta are, are producing different kinds of stories that are not necessarily that closely locally reflective for us. But just one correction I want to make there. Um, the other thing that's really exciting for us, and it began last year, um, and we just did a very soft launch of this program, but we have been offered uh, a performance envelope from the CMF. And that's, um, <laughs> thanks, Sue. It's, it's really, I mean, honestly, that was a very thrilling moment and a kind of, yikes, kind of what do we do with this kind of moment, right? Because um, as I've just described, the money that we have used to support documentary is very specific and does not play well with CMF money. So what we've had to do then and what we've been doing over the last year is um, creating a new stream of content uh, for TELUS that will allow us to uh, support productions um, and also 
allocate funds to them from our CMF performance envelope. So we're very excited that we've managed to get this off the ground. We're doing a three year cycle of production uh, to test this out, to see how this goes. We expect um, to have wonderful successes and you know we have to, uh, we have to test the waters with the three year cycle. Um, we greenlit three shows uh, last year quite um, quickly because it took us basically all year to figure out what the structure of this new program might be. And so then we had to act quickly before the CMF deadline and use some of the, the projects were in our pipeline. Um, quickly, uh, for TELUS Originals and for what we are tentatively calling TELUS Independent, we're not even, I mean, this is so hot off the press that we're, we haven't even really uh, codified the branding for this new stream yet, but we're calling it TELUS Independent uh, at the moment. The reason we're contemplating that name is we want people to understand that none of the content that we make, and we want to reinforce this, is overlaid with any kind of corporate messaging. We want to, and we do, support authentic communities, authentic voices from real communities. We want to support the films that you are passionate about making, and that is very important to us, and it's important that people understand that. And um, we are, um, we have, I think, over the last few years established some credibility and we're very, uh, we're very grateful to all of you for trusting us. Um, that said, quickly, our uh, main areas of interest are health and well-being, flourishing communities. These are large buckets. You can see that they can be quite widely interpreted. The environment and sustainability, connectivity and technology. Um, this is an odd one to think about in terms of a film. How does one make that visual? But a recent example is we have a film about people who used uh, uh, refugees in a detainment camp who used cell phone footage and, and cell phone technologies to uh, secure the release from the camp, to secure new homes in other countries and ultimately to get the camp shut down. So that's an example of a connectivity story that we would support. Also food systems and security. So um, those are our five areas. Uh, of impact. And I think I'll stop there for now, Sarah, but we can talk. Well, about that's fantastic. I mean, I just, it's such good news. I love hearing that there's new funding in the, in the landscape. That's also collaborative funding that's interested in the creative doc space. So over to you, Adam, um, with what Christina said about the editorial lines, maybe you can talk a little bit about what is your editorial vision for the docs that you're looking at? And is there overlap with some of the stuff that Christina is talking about? Oh, and I think you are muted. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Um, so my, my dog barked earlier. Um, <laughs> okay. So I muted myself. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that we are, um, it, it depends on the kind of format, I guess, we're, we're talking about. Should I talk? about series or, or whatever feature. you feel I think that what's interesting is like there's a lot of flexibility I think for everyone around the table in terms of the format so um I think just in terms of yeah like editorial approach for either and if they're different maybe for both yeah for sure yeah so I, th I think it gosh it depends it we do we do a lot so I, I as I you're, you're speaking I, I did a little hunt in my spreadsheets and uh saw that we did um 27 original doc series last year and five um, doc features. Um, and so I'm just trying to, to organize kind of different um, opportunities for, for creators. So, you know, there are, there are documentary series that we do that are really um, indigenous language focused. And those tend to be um, projects that are really embedded in the community. Um, working closely with uh, knowledge keepers, language speakers um, that are primarily for uh, uh, an audience of um, fluent language speakers or uh, language learners. Um, and, and that also includes, although it's not usually documentary content, but, uh, but children's programming as well. Um, so that's, that's one niche and, and we kind of have to, to split it up because our, our mandate is so large. Um, so we're definitely looking to to connect with language speakers in in uh, language speakers and seekers in a big way. Um, there's another um, focus that 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 we have, which is you know I would say like doing things that are in the the 
environment, um, animals, nature, um, connecting with land, air, water, and that can be anything from environmental docs to um, much more um, you know, uh, educational or informative documentary series. Um, and depending on the, the budget level, those have to, you know, th those have to either be like very audience friendly formats or they can be something that is maybe like a, a little bit um, more challenging. Um, the feature space, I think, is just super wide open. You know, we want um, those documentary features that really cut through um, a lot of the noise because they're they're one-offs and and because we're a 24-hour broadcaster if you've got a one-off and you want people to find it it has to be something that ha has a, a topic and characters um, that are going to kind of demand attention so you know really exciting visual approaches interesting approaches to um, uh, unusual approaches to storytelling you know having a, a lot to say and a real stamp of, of authorship is something that you know, of course, we're looking at in all of the different um, content spaces that we're talking about, but that's something that's really, really important for features in particular, I would say. Um, but yeah, because we, we, we do a lot of different documentary series, it really, um, it's hard, it's hard to, to kind of limit it and focus it to what we're, what we're looking for, because there's a lot of different needs for the network. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll, I'll have sense. I'll have more thoughts on that. I feel like it's it's I'm being very vague and I don't intend to be, but um, it is it is pretty open. And the best thing I would say is that if you have projects that you think are eligible or and you you want to work with us, then um, let's connect and talk about your project and see if it's uh, it's something that might be a fit. Um, history is something that we're also really uh, actively trying to uh, pursue and develop and encourage. Uh, producers that we work with to dig into because um, in you know, well-researched Indigenous histories are something that our audiences are, are really hungry for um, and um, that they just can't find anywhere else. Okay, thanks so much, Adam. Um, and then over to you, Knowledge. Um, does this connect with um, your editorial line as you're setting it up right now? What kind of projects are you guys looking for? And I, you've already mentioned that you do like getting involved at the development stage. So um, maybe you can talk, I guess, primarily if we're assuming that the filmmakers in the room are coming to you with projects in development, what are some of the things that you guys are looking for in that early stage? Yeah, so, um, you know, like I had said earlier, we do commission for the Storyville strand. So that is a social issues documentary strand, POV, um, character driven films. Um, they're usually uh, contemporary, but we will sometimes, sometimes there's history incorporated in the films as well. Um, really looking for that authentic storytelling. Um, you know, we don't really do investigative uh, type films, um, sort of nature science type films would not be a priority uh, for a commissioning strand. We're really looking for those stories that are going to have that shelf life and stand the test of time. And we're really looking at what is your visual aesthetic approach to the film that's going to help sort of tell those stories. So, um, you know, just to kind of help give a sense of the types of projects, we've got a few projects in production. So one of them is Forbidden Music with Barbara Hager that looks at Austrian born musicologist Ida Halpern, who um, basically had recorded um, the intellectual property of indigenous songs and that um, those songs have really um, brought an insurgence um, to the communities and having those so songs recorded. So this is a film that really is kind of looking at the history and using archival material, but also really brings in the present day. And it's a film that really sort of covers, it's a film that has many layers to it. Um, uh, which is something that um, really works for us. We also have a project, Planet 911, um, with Nova and me and Belko Ripper, which really is sort of looking at the, the uh, climate crisis and how do we survive, thrive, and transform. Um, and it's really looking at from the perspective of a really diverse group of women who are working on the front lines. Um, and then we have a project uh, called Danae, which um, is with Thea Liu. 
And it really um, explores, this is a really personal POV film um, through her experience and looking at the mental health impact um, of labor migration policies for the Filipino Canadian community and sort of the harmful um, um, impacts it's having on vulnerable communities. So it's a really sort of, it's just sort of an example of the really kind of broad range from really personal um, stories to kind of stories that bring in that historical elements to kind of um, environment is a, is a uh, topic that really resonates with our viewers. So hopefully that will give you a sense of there's a lot of diversity in the types of projects that we're looking for. And I think I would just add also we do do limited series. And I think if anyone is familiar with our programming on limited series, we've done like emergency room, life and death at BGH, um, search, and arrest, search and Rescue series. Um, these are films that really sort of was uh, an organization or an institution that really sort of filmed the high stakes that happened. And I think that we're really looking uh, to open that up and have a broader canvas in terms of the kinds of series that we're looking for. Michelle, am I missing anything? <laughs> no, you covered it really well, Patrice. <laughs> okay. So hopefully that helps give a sense of the kinds of projects we're looking for. I think it really does. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, another thing that's exciting at this moment in time, so DOC, as many of you know, has really changed a lot in the last few years. Our membership has grown quite a bit. And the largest membership category that we have is a category for filmmakers who are Black, Indigenous, or racialized, which is now about 50% of our membership. So, um, you know, Adam, obviously you've addressed that you're working with mostly Indigenous filmmakers. Uh, the rest of you around the table have said that that is a priority for you as well. But I'm wondering if you could address what are some of the sort of structural or concrete measures that you've done to make sure that you're hearing from these filmmakers? And I guess I'll maybe knowledge, do you want to start? Because you have uh, sort of these huge targets that you put out last year. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I'll say a couple of words and then I'll just throw to Patrice. But yeah, so knowledge um, established equity based targets for um, Indigenous led production companies and BPOC led production companies last year. So that came online in, in 2022. And it's um, commitments that run over three years. And that's kind of just beginning. So there will be more after that. So that commitment is that 50% of our documentaries will be with BPOC uh, production companies, owned production companies, majority owned, and 25% with Indigenous owned production companies. As Patrice mentioned, we're you know doing a relatively small number of commissions and we do look at projects year round. So to help kind of fast track those projects that are coming from the Indigenous and, and BPOC communities, there's a special development stream that people can go into and that just helps to kind of fast track those projects through our through our system. Um, and I'll let Patrice speak more about specific initiatives and, and, and outreach to make sure that we're engaging with a broader cross section of the documentary community. Yeah, so so just to sort of um, talk a little bit about that initiative. So what, what we are doing is we're doing a call for development proposals um, uh, for Indigenous and racialized producers. So what we're doing is we're supporting the development phase with a development fee from Knowledge Network as well um, as an allocation from our development, our CMF development envelope. So the call for proposals, we, we do do announcement um, around May um, with a deadline in um, uh, early August, and then we'll make decisions in September um, and move the projects forward into development. So the goal is that they'll have kind of the rest of that fiscal year uh, to work on their projects so that the, the development deliverables will be coming in early in the fiscal year um, and that will help make our decisions. So, so through that initiative, you know, we've done information sessions and also it's just been a really great way to connect with filmmakers. Um, it, we may not be able to move forward with their project at that specific time, but it's a great way to start the conversation going and building those relationships. So that initiative has really um, been beneficial for us. 
And the other is just, you know, getting out into the community. It's great that events are live again and participating in hot docs or the BAMP television fund or different festivals and just um, trying to trying to be out there and connect with the community. Yeah, thank you. There's so many um, there's so many things I want to talk about, but we're almost out of time. I'm going to just check in on the um, uh, questions from the audience. Um, there. OK, so uh, is that development envelope only for BC BIPOC filmmakers? Correct. Or can that Okay, so that's yeah. what we see. Okay, yeah, great. so just, just to clarify, when, when we participate as a second window, the appropriate time to come to knowledge is once the development phase is complete and the lead broadcaster is confirmed. So we don't support development fund projects with um, projects we were, where we would be considering a second window. So this, is, uh, this initiative or development is specifically for BC producers. Okay, so someone would develop their film, they'd go first to Adam, or they'd go to Christina, and then they'd come to Knowledge Network for a second window. Okay, and then bring in Sue for the for the outreach. Yeah. Exactly. So if we may, can yes. I uh, just add a couple of things, please? Um, one is that I forgot to say we also fund limited series. So um, that is um, that is definitely a part of what we do. We've just recently launched How Special, which is a really wonderful uh, series um, about uh, Chinese Canadian restaurants across the country, actually, well, BC and Alberta. Um, not surprisingly, hosted by Jackie Kyalis, and uh, it's had a really wonderful um, launch, and it's been, and I know that we're going to talk about impact production, but they had a, a wonderful publicist. We love to work with shows that, that bring publicists, and we allow, of course, a publicist line item in your budget. So um, there's that, but also in terms of um, specifically um, how we work and I know you haven't actually asked me to answer this yet, but if I may with- Please go for it, yeah. Indigenous BIPOC producers. Um, we of course uh, require, and when it comes to indigenous themed programming, we require our producers to abide by the on-screen protocols and pathways document from Imaginative and the ISO. We also have, um, not on the TELUS original side, but on the StoryHive side, there are active collaborations with the ISO and the BSO, and there have been, since I first uh, arrived at Tell us is when you know, we were starting to talk about how do we do this? How do we reduce barriers? How do we make what we do uh, accessible and relevant to communities other than the ones traditionally represented? So that's been part of our content DNA at Tell us for a long time and certainly also translates over to Tell us Originals and also to the uh, new program that we are preliminarily calling TELUS Independent. We don't strictly require 51% Indigenous ownership at this time of content, but we do absolutely require Indigenous key creative for when it comes to Indigenous themed films. We always will ask you, how is this story to tell? How is this your story to tell? Why are you wanting to tell it now? But also, you know, come to us with stakeholders from the community that you're seeking to represent, attached, involved from the beginning to the end of your film and help us understand why this is the right, the right story for, for you to be telling. Um, uh, further to that, we always, um, actually I'll give some examples. Um, there are films that we uh, funded this year from our newly launching program. We have a story from a feature film, feature length doc from Barbara Hagar that reimagines um, and um, exposes the fallacies of the generally accepted narrative of how First Nations people arrived on the um, on Turtle Island um, and really unpicks this idea that people just wandered aimlessly across the Bering Straits and places the, the knowledge of all of that migration where it belongs and where the knowledge has been held in Indigenous communities throughout North America. So it's a really exciting retelling of that. We have one film in development this year. We had a small development uh, envelope and we're supporting a film um, from Carrie Ann Cardinal, uh, directed by Jules Kostachin, um, that or to be directed by her, um, that is about the Red Power Movement and really traces the work of Deb Mearns, who was active in the 1970s. Um, to really um, 
uh, and was very part of the, the caravan, the Indigenous caravan that went across Canada and was really seminal at the beginning of the Red Power Movement and the first woman, Indigenous woman, um, to be called to the bar in Canada as well. Um, and we have one about microplastics from Peter Raymond. Um, so not from the Vicopoc community, but something that we feel really addresses a discourse or really weighs into a discourse that is vital in terms of the survival of our planet at this time. These are the kinds of things that we are looking for. And in Telus Originals as well, we do do historical docs, but we always will look for a forward moving narrative in the present. How does this um, feed into something that's happening now that is pressing, that is in the zeitgeist that Canadians really want to know about, that stakeholder communities are wanting to move forward. Um, uh, Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I think it's great to hear, um, you know, the kinds of projects you're working on. I'm sure it's giving everyone in the room a lot of ideas about what they're going to email you to pitch. <laughs> um, there's a the knowledge development uh, program sparked a few questions. So I have a couple over to you, uh, Patrice and Michelle. Um, so there's two about that. So one is, uh, should people wait for the BIPOC call for the call for entries before submitting, if they've already been in touch with a producer at Knowledge? Like, are you really wanting to have that intake all together? And the other one is, uh, is the Knowledge Development Fund available to eligible producers who have received telefilm development money? So those two about how to access the development program. Um, yeah, so I, I think that with regards to the call for proposals, it really is um, the driver for us right now in terms of the projects, a lot of the projects that we're moving into production. So um, I can tell you that we have had some conversations with filmmakers so we can start those conversations, but what we're typically doing is recommend, recommending that those uh, producers consider applying for, um, for the development initiative. Um, and it, the telephone funding, it's not something that we've looked at before, like I said before, um, you know, with, with the development fund, um, I can tell you that there has also been a shift with Creative BC where um, historically, um, if you had CMF development funding, they didn't always fund the development and that, that has been a shift this year. So I can tell you that with the projects that move forward into development this fiscal year, a lot of them had both uh, had Creative BC, uh, our development envelope, um, as well as our CMF development envelope. The telefilm is not something we've done in the past, but we can take a look and see whether or not there's a potential fit. It's really about uh, um, also fitting with all the timelines that we're working on as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Patrice. Um, and then another question also, Adam, I see you've been posting how people can be pitching you and reaching out and, and reading more about um, commissions to APTN. So I invite everyone to just check out the those posts that Adam's been putting in the chat. Um, and then I have another question for you, Christina, just about how audiences um, are going to access your programming. So is it VOD, uh, SVOD subscribers? Is it only available? Like where are people able to access the content, um, say they're not in Alberta or in BC? Yeah, thank you for asking that, sir. First of all, I'd just like to say I answered in the chat, but we oh, absolutely support, we have a very wide um, bucket uh, when it comes to the kaleidoscope of, of communities uh, speaking, deserving, driving representation. So absolutely LGBTQI2S+, plus. Um, I'm queer and I can't get that straight, I'm always saying it wrongly, because uh, it's always expanding. But absolutely, we have a lot of content in that category. Um, also, um, increasingly in the disabilities narrative, that's been a place that has been underrepresented, certainly in general, and for us as well. And we are building that. We've also been keeping data um, in our representation categories uh, for uh, the last four years. And we use that data to drive our programming choices. So just making that um, transparent for you as well. Um, 
And now I've forgotten your question, Sarah. So it's just audiences. Oh, um, thank you. Where, yes. where can everyone see the content, all this thank wonderful you. content you're commissioning? Yeah. So um, what we commissioned through the TELUS original stream is primarily available mm -hmm. on our subscriber video on demand platform. So it's available to TELUS subscribers as a value add in BC and Alberta. We have also had a YouTube platform that lends itself really well to the our other programs, not the TELUS originals, but is um, not, it, it, we do have some content up on YouTube under our TELUS originals banner, but as I'm sure you're already thinking, well, how does that work with rights? And if we're wanting to exploit our programs, how on earth are we going to be able to do that when, when they're on YouTube? So we very routinely give holdbacks for that. Uh, there are certain kinds of content that it's suitable for, but we are also developing now alternate strategies for curated content offerings on other platforms apart from YouTube. So, so uh, to stay tuned to more information on that. And then um, when it comes to your new stream of content, uh, tell us independent, that'll be available to subscribers, but it will also be available on other platforms as they develop uh, for tell us across Canada. Stream Plus is one of our digital distribution platforms. Also tell us presents is um, a, a TVOD platform. Is it TVOD or HVOD, I think. So there are a, a few other platforms that will be available on um, nationally as well. Again, watch for more, more specific details. Okay. Um, it's a really exciting, exciting moment, um, I think, for all filmmakers. And I also just want to invite everyone, like some of the positive changes that we've had in the sector have been because filmmakers had reached out to Doc with what they want what their aspirations are for a more sustainable, accessible, equitable sector. So please don't hesitate as you're navigating the system to reach out and let us know what it is you want to see, because I think that this is how we end up moving forward together as a community. Um, and, you know, as you can see, everyone around the table is game and up for it. Um, so um, maybe just to, it's two o'clock. Uh, this hour has gone by really quickly. I feel like there's a lot more we want to hear from everyone. And, um, you know, Sue, we definitely want to hear about how the story money impact um, is growing and changing. And I think we'll have to do a follow-up session at some point, maybe in six months to see how, Adam, how's your feature doc strand going? How's the CMF envelope going? How's it going across the board with all the different partners? So um, it was a great first discussion. Thanks everyone for being here. And uh, if you have any questions, reach out to our team, info at docorg.ca. And uh, I guess we'll adjourn and, and hopefully see everybody soon. Thank you so much to all the panelists. I really appreciate your taking the time. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. Sarah. Thanks so much for yeah, having us. There is so much more to say. And I'm, thank you, our senior marketing manager, Kelly Fox, for topping up where you can see our content in the chat there. So. Thanks to all, all right. the filmmakers who do great work. Yes. <laughs> None of us would be around otherwise. <laughs> so thank you. Indeed. All right. Thanks, all. Well, hopefully, we'll see Mel, like many of you at Hot Docs or at Doxa or at other upcoming events. Have See a great you afternoon. then. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.